This is a secondary video relating to um, preparing, you know, hopping in and out for work, etc., uh, to the UK as and when needed. Um, and this is a response to David Dolan's uh, email uh, comment regarding it's okay if you go up somewhere to stay in the UK. When I went to Norfolk and Suffolk, because I was managing, um, well, surveying and managing maintenance on uh, housing association properties there. The first week involved this. Fuel, which was £170 worth of fuel. Um, the insurance for the car, because I had to upgrade my brother's insurance. So that was another £130. Renting, um, I had to pay one month's deposit plus one month up front, so six, seven, just shy of a thousand pounds for the first week. My cash flow after that was three pounds for fuel, for food. That was it, <laughs> I had three quid. Um, I'd rented a room rather than a building because short term contracts, I don't want a big place, I want somewhere, uh, can I have a chat with the owner and go look, I'm going next month, contracts coming to the end, etc, etc. Don't want to be locked into six months, etc. A um, bit of advice with that. Looking on things like Gumtree, Craigslist and what have you, you'll find people with rooms to rent. Um, the other side of that being um, bed and breakfasts, you know, and above pubs. There's all sorts of ways of finding cheap accommodation. Now, I survived the first week on three pounds um, I worked the first week, three pounds, and this is why I work contract. I do agency when I can because on that Friday, timesheet signed, bang. By Monday, that should already be in the process to be getting paid. So by Wednesday, it should already hit my bank account, and that's basically it. By the Wednesday, I'd receive my first payment. Um, Back then, it was probably about seven hundred pounds for the week, you know, after tax. So, the point being is, yes, I know you need to to uh, plan this stuff ahead, and that's why I do plan ahead. This is the whole point of this: is to say, look, don't assume everything's going to be fantastic and go all your way, because nine times out of ten, there'll be one hiccup that creates a domino effect. Um, that's what I was saying about guys when they have problems with their partners, he steals the passport or doesn't process the visas, etc. So you budget it for the next, say, eight months and then you get a, tw uh, well, you're going to get 1,000 peso fine per month. It might have gone up to 1,500 or something now. So it's a bit like a friend of mine where he thought she'd actually processed it and she hadn't, she'd pocketed the money. So by the time he went to immigration and was querying something, he already owed them 20,000 in fines. Never mind all the back pay. That's not including that he hasn't paid the, the visa fees because that's all extra. Um, so you end up with a hefty bill and one that's unexpected, what unprepared for. That's why, like your visa stuff, if you've got a few guys that have been doing it with the same guy for the last few years, Trust them. I mean, it's like um, Paul Whiteway at Cebu, I think it's Cebu Expat Services or something he calls, calls his business. Um, I've known Paul since he arrived in the Philippines. He, he actually arrived 2007, 2008. Um, and he's a stand-up guy, you can trust Paul. But I've had it with, um, what do you call it, travel agents where it's not been worth their while to do it. So they, they've actually sat on it for a couple of days before even processing. That could actually be to the point where you could get a fine if they didn't have a bit of manipulation inside those offices where they go, you know, it's all right, we're coming tomorrow because I haven't, I need another two to make it worth my while to travel over. So be aware, a lot of this stuff you need to look at. You know, don't assume somebody will do it for you. Um, unless you actually know them very well or know people that you can trust know them very well um, but also be prepared that things don't always go to plan when we got hit with a typhoon it just followed an earthquake we'd had an earthquake for the the, the month before 
um, which had over a thousand tremors over that period of time. I couldn't open the call center. I wouldn't. I mean, I could have done, but I didn't because the fact is, I'd rather people were home with their families because if there was a major earthquake, you don't want to be in the next town or something. You want to be with your family, making sure everybody's okay. So it's like I pay people to stay at home. Then we had the typhoon that took out the internet, um, took the power off for a, a day. But was I prepared? The answer is yes, because I had enough money in my bank to keep things going. Um, although it sort of halted the the um, call center for a bit because our internet was down, we diversified. We moved from the telemarketing side and moved on to doing graphic stuff. We moved on to doing um, transcription services for YouTube videos and stuff like that. We made sure that we found a way to make money even when things weren't going our way. All that takes is going, okay, no point crying about it, whatever, how are we gonna fix it? And this is what we did. We just sat there and said, right, who, who do we know? Oh, we, we know uh, Robert um, over the other side of Cebu. He does transcription. He's doing okay at it. So we've got in touch with Robert and worked together on it. This is the this is how you've got to work it. You've got to um, lean on each other. You know, when I have something that's golden, um, like for example, when I was doing the solar stuff, I gave the contract to another six, seven call centers. Um, not d indirectly, but directly, so that everybody expanded out. Because that is something that people don't normally do in the Philippines. I mean, I've got somebody at the moment trying to contact me regarding, oh, we have services in Dubai, blah, blah, blah. First thing is, it, 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 I mean, this sounds a bit bad, but if it's a Filipino doing it from the Philippines, I have alarm bells straight away unless I know them um, because there's too many middlemen. I won't work with middlemen. Um, I'm not interested. I'll be honest with you, I really am not interested. They're normally about five tiers down as well being Filipinos because people like, don't like to talk about racism. Racism exists. The tier ones will be the US in, in Saudi and Dubai and that. It'll be Arabs. Then it'll be Indian Pakistanis because they're normally the office staff in a lot of these places then it will drop down to somebody I need call centre help who could be Indian Pakistani or Filipino who will then drop it down to this person that says in the Philippines I've got a call centre and working out of a bedroom somewhere who then goes and tells everybody that they're running the contract all these people above them are running it all they're doing is going right this down to the guy that's told to get a call centre they're all on the payroll of the business. Once it hits this other person below, they want 50% for doing absolutely nothing. All the risk is yours. They're not interested in quality, nine times out of ten. The quality is the last thing on their mind. The only thing they're interested in is money. They won't invest in training. They won't assist you. They'll, they'll just turn around and milk it for what they can get. Often, when the client goes, right, this is naff, I'm not paying it, who who loses out? Do they? No, they never invested anything. They might lose that client. The person who loses is you because you've got all the wages to pay. So that's why I don't deal with middlemen. Um, not because our quality is bad, because our quality is pretty good. Um, but the fact is that I need to make sure the guys are going to get paid. And as such, middlemen couldn't care less. I've seen contracts that pay $150 at the top per... Um, what do you call it, per lead, and by the time it gets to the guy actually running a call center, it's $20, and I'm just like, forget it, you, I'm not, you know, it wasn't me that was running it, I just refused to do it, um, but the guy that was doing it was struggling to break even, you know, and I'm like, this is, you're having a laugh, but then when you start getting into the business, you start to see, right, this guy doesn't know anything about the call center, he just knows somebody with a call center, but he does know this person who works at another call centre, who knows somebody that's looking for call centres, who's looking f uh, to a friend in the US that needs somebody to do all the work for them. But uh, I've gone completely off tangent. But the, the, moving aside, 
Um, it's all about preparation. Um, when I go back to the UK, there's money. I, that's why I keep saying keep an emergency fund. It doesn't matter if you've got to have accommodation or whatever, because you've got to have accommodation. If you're going well, if if I need so much for accommodation that it doesn't pay me to do it, the fact is, if you're having to contemplate the fact that you may need to go home or back to the West, then you're already contemplating the risk of needing to do it, which means you need that fund. You know, there's no getting away from it. You need that fund. If you're going, well, I've got a pension now, I really don't care about it, that's fine. The only thing I would ask you, do you have good med medical insurance? Because I tell you now, if you don't, your pension will get eaten like no tomorrow. When it comes to dialysis and other stuff, if something goes wrong, they'll have your house and everything you've, you've worked for the last 20 years for. Because that's what happens. Um, the Philippines hospitals are a business. They're not a charitable organization that has got its pure heart in your well-being. It is a business, and that's the bottom line. Nothing more than getting money out of you. Um, yeah, they may heal you, but like with April was in labor, when I wanted to go home and have a shower and stuff in the morning, the guards are looking for me. I am Bill Payer. It, it, they've got no restrictions on me. You know, what they're going to say, you know, they try to stop me leaving, it's very likely to be a punch-up. Because the, the, the fact is, I've already put, I think, 30 or 50,000 pesos down as a deposit, um, which is more than the birth anyway. But they're like, oh, 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 oh he's left the building, he's left the... It's none of your business. I'm not even on the contract. All I do is, I'm bill payer. My wife's done all the paperwork. Anyway, preparation, that's what I'm saying. It doesn't matter what it is. Preparation's a key to everything in life. Pensions. Um, I know a lot of people are bringing up about the pensions at the moment in the UK because they're saying, well, it's not really going to pay out. Well, I've written my, wrote mine off. I, I'm treating it as toilet paper. It, worthless. Um, if it pays off later on, fine. But I'll tell you now, I do not trust this government. I do not trust the Labour government when it gets in next time because it's going to go after the private pensions. The best pension is offshore, out of sight, out of mind because the UK tax system is only in the UK so if you get it offshore and out of sight it's none of their business and it, oh that's so wrong that's so wrong all the newspapers do it all the MPs do it and anybody with a bit of common sense does it um, this whole ethics th thing if, if you're worried about that I would start with their MP expenses look after yourself because nobody else will alright thanks for watching